All right, we're giving it just another minute before we get started. Welcome, Bremen. Doretta's bread. What is that? Is that a bakery or? Oops. So I meant to send that to just Ted, but his <laughs> wife makes fantastic bread out of Whoa. their, I hope not to give it away, out of their awesome bison farm. Um, wow. So. Unbelievable. Unexpected turn of events. All I know right, we're Ted, holding for... our next meeting. Hi, Naples and Sanford, and I see 12.04, so we're going to get going. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to Solar Siting for Municipalities, Tools, and Experiences, brought to you by Maine Audubon and the Maine Municipal Association. I am Nick Lund, the Advocacy and Outreach Manager for Maine Audubon, and I will be your host today. Um, let's get started. So Maine Audubon is working hard to protect our state's wildlife and wildlife habitat from the impacts of climate change. Uh, we know that aggressively cutting our carbon emissions from all sectors is the key to meeting strong climate goals set by the Mills administration, and that electricity from renewable sources is a major part of that. Um, Maine Audubon has long been a supporter of renewable energy, uh, and just this month we completed installation of some solar panels at our Fields Pond Audubon Center in Holden. I see some Holden folks on today. Um, that's near Bangor. That was done with our partners at Revision Energy. Um, but like any new land use or development, uh, if not thoughtfully cited or operated, new renewable energy development could displace wildlife habitat or otherwise unduly impact Maine's natural resources. Um, that's why we're proud to have recently released our renewable energy siting tool, a GIS tool that provides resources for developers and decision makers um, to locate solar and land-based wind projects in areas that avoid or minimize negative impacts to important wildlife habitats. So today on the webinar, my colleague, Sarah Haggerty, Maine Audubon's GIS manager and conservation biologist, will take you through the renewable, uh, renewable energy siting tool. Hello, Sarah. And then we will also hear from Ben Axelman, the manager of solar development at Nexamp, who will discuss other aspects of municipal solar development. Hello, Ben. Um, a few technical uh, pieces before we get started. I will be the moderator, obviously. Um, the attendees, the folks joining us today, you'll be muted for the duration of the presentation. So please, if you have questions, um, put them in the Q&A box below. That is the, um, the two little speech bubbles down below. I know we're all Zoom experts by now, but I have to go through this stuff. Um, the Q&A box is the two little speech bubbles down below. We're gonna save all the questions for the end. Uh, which just helps people get out, make sure we end on time. Um, and if you have comments or again, want to say uh, where you're zooming in from, please type those in the chat um, over on that side. Um, so, all right. Um, we are proud to offer this presentation today in association with the Maine Municipal Association. And now I want to get started by turning it over to my colleague, Neil Goldberg from MMA. Neil. Great. Thank you, Nick, uh, and thank you for, for hosting this. I, I have to say, MMA is, is truly the uh, little brother in this presentation today. It is all Maine Audubon, so uh, kudos to you, um, as well as kudos to this tool that is being presented. Um, often, all of the time, um, I am hearing from our members, especially our smaller communities, that technical capacity is lacking on the ground level. And so this GIS tool is something that is, honestly, it's expensive. Um, and so having access, it, access to it for your planning purposes for our municipal members is, um, is, is truly incredible. Um, so happy to actually be uh, spectating and learning about that. Um, thank you. But um, so a few updates before I, we get into the meat of this presentation. Um, MMA is obviously here to support all of our municipalities and their needs. Um, and one of the things that we are focused on at the moment is just gauging the municipal um, comfortability or capacity for solar energy ordinances. Uh, I'm not the best person to talk about this, but we did recently run a survey to gauge some information, and we have some preliminary results that I will share. Uh, of the municipalities that responded to our survey, about a third have community ordinances regulating solar development. 
two thirds don't. What we're seeing though, is that that number is going to quickly increase. And it's, incre it's largely being driven by these um, distributed generation projects, those solar panel projects that are under five megawatts. And there's a wide array of opinions on these projects, but generally speaking, they seem to be a slight uh, nuisance to our members. Um, at least these are the anecdotal comments we got from the survey because of the um, difficulty with connection, connecting to substations, the capacity at transfer stations isn't always sufficient. And finally, a big concern for us is always the assessment value um, and taxes paid on or taxes not paid on those developments. So those are some of the things that we heard from our survey. Other things that are preventing developments from going forward anecdotally are things like visual impacts, um, the, uh, the belief that it will impact property values on abutting properties, um, the noise associated with it. And then there is the, the topic of decommissioning outdated or um, old panels, which I believe this group can speak to it, that there is actually a plan that's often written into those projects on how to decommission, but that there needs to maybe be some education around it. Um, so again, just anecdotally what we heard. Um, and by the way, uh, a more formal report will follow in the coming weeks on not just solar ordinances, but the other topics we surveyed, climate change and forestry um, and the like. MMA is also sitting as a participant in two working groups that are of interest to this to our attendees today. The first is the distributed generation stakeholder group that was legislatively created. And the second is the agricultural so solar stakeholder group. I've already kind of hit on a little bit of both of those and would be happy to talk offline about what's going on. Uh, but MMA is representing our members in those two groups. Um, I think, again, no surprise to the group and the attendees here today, but the issue of assessment and property valuation is key in both of these groups. Um, I think, for instance, in the agricultural solar, the discussion is, is this agricultural equipment or is this a solar energy appliance? Um, and where is that decision going to fall? Finally, before I turn it back over, I have to always put a shout out for ARPA. Uh, the American Rescue Plan is in motion. Money is hitting bank accounts. Communities are making decisions and spending those funds. So if you have any questions regarding access, reporting, eligibility, please reach out to MMA, reach out to myself. Um, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, so had to get that out there. But with that said, I'm going to toss it back over to Nick. Thank you for having us and I'm very excited. Awesome. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, it's a real honor to present with MMA today. So thanks so much. And all right, without further ado, uh, we'll turn things over to Maine Audubon, Sarah Haggerty, who will take us through the Renewable Energy Siting Tool and some other things. And uh, I'm going to shut our video off and Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Nick. You see those my presentation mode. Um, thanks again, Nick. Thanks, uh, Neil, for having us here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk today about some of our solar siting tools. I'm going to run quickly through all of the tools in our toolbox, um, but really focus most of my slot of time on the newest one, which is the Renewable Energy Siting Tool, which is that online GIS map. Um, as Nick mentioned, the reason that Maine Audubon is, is so involved in renewable energy is that our mission is to conserve Maine's wildlife and their habitats, and right now climate change is the most significant threat to wildlife and habitats. About a third of the plants and animals and their habitats in Maine are already being impacted. And that includes some of our most iconic main base species, the moose, the loon, um, brook trout, puffins, things that the species that people think about when they think of Maine are already being impacted by climate change. And that's why we really support the policies to transition to a clean energy economy. And we're really um, trying to work hard to help achieve that goal of reaching 100% renewable energy in Maine by 2050. 
But we do understand that renewable energy projects, just like any project, can have impacts on those same wildlife and habitats that we are concerned about. So a couple of years ago, we did some uh, major literature review, really looking at, well, what are the things that we should be worried about? What are the potential impacts to wildlife and their habitats of renewable energy? And how can we avoid, minimize, and mitigate those impacts? This report is on our website, um, and it focuses not just on solar, but also on onshore wind, offshore wind, and transmission. And as Neil mentioned, um, Right now, our electric grid is, is pretty maxed out. We are going to need more transmission. We just want to make sure that it gets put in the right places and, and maintained the right way. But today, I want to focus really on solar um, because that's really starting to hit the ground in Maine very quickly. And um, we heard from solar developers and from planners and towns and, and um, other partners that that as solar became came very quickly to Maine, Folks weren't quite sure what to do. How do we cite it? Where, what do we need to think about and worry about? And so we wanted to pull together some tools. And the biggest thing with solar is really about siting. Most of those impacts can are um, happen because of where the project ends up sited, how big it is, how it's how it's maintained. So um, one of the first tools that we pulled together was with our partners in conservation and agriculture um, to think about best practices. Right. Very generally speaking, what are some best practice, practices for siting solar on natural in natural areas and also in agricultural areas? And then some general BMPs for solar generally. Not surprisingly, the priority should really be um, on disturbed and developed lands so that we're not consuming additional natural and agricultural lands. Avoid the highest value wildlife habitats and the highest value agricultural lands. Stay near existing infrastructure and population centers so that we're not fragmenting additional um, habitats with the transmission lines and distribution lines. And we really want to see folks engaging with local communities. We want to see municipalities and communities working together with developers so that we can get more renewable energy on the landscape, but in the right places to have the least impact and so that everyone ends up happy at the end. And all of these tools are available at mainaudubon.org forward slash solar. So I'm just gonna go really quickly through them, but you can peruse them at your leisure. The next piece that we pulled together, as Neil actually mentioned, was um, something to help municipalities with local ordinances. Um, we were hearing from folks that, Folks didn't know where does this fit into zoning and do we need a special ordinance? And so we wanted to try and, and help out. Understanding, of course, that the what your approach is in your locality is going to change um, depending on where you are. So your neighbor, your neighboring town may approach things very differently. Um, and we really focused on site plan review and conditional use permits. And we have some, some draft language, some model language to use. We also have some highlighted areas to um, make sure that you understand specific things, make sure you're thinking about this and thinking about that. And then we have an example table of permitting where different permitting tools can be used in different places. Always have your town council review. And again, this is just a guide, it's a model. Um, use it to suit your particular needs for your locality. And then we also worked with NRCM to try and answer some of the most frequently asked questions. Again, sort of generally speaking, um, general solar energy project questions about how, how and where solar projects are happening in Maine, some of the physical features of solar projects, and then community considerations. And finally, to the most exciting piece of the morning, the day, um, is our, our newest tool, which is the main renewable energy siting tool. This is an online viewer. What I'm going to do now is try to switch over to that viewer and do a live demonstration. I do sometimes have a conflict with Zoom and the viewer, which will kick me out of the, zoo, the viewer. So I'm hoping that won't happen. If it does, I do have slides. They're just not quite as fun um, as actually doing the... Um, the viewer. So I'm going to stop sharing and go back in. And as I say, if you if you put in mainaudubon.org forward slash solar, you don't have to put advocacy there, you will come to our, our solar webpage. All of those tools that I mentioned are here and just with a little drop down, including a link to the renewable energy siting tool. We have built a solar map or a, a story map 
to walk you through the tool so that if you don't get everything that I say in the next 15 minutes, you can go back to this and it will help walk you, help you walk through um, how to use the tool. It explains why we built it, some of the resources that we're concerned about, and it explains how the tool works. And I wanted to use this just to, to show the basic premise of this is that it's a, it uses a stoplight model, sort of a red, yellow, green, where green are areas that we would, in, we would encourage development. These are areas that are like landfills and gravel pits and already developed areas. This is where we would like to see development focused, whether it's solar development or any other kind of development. Red areas at the other end of the spectrum are the areas we'd like to see avoided. These are rare species habitat, natural communities, wetlands, buffered streams, areas like that. This tool is not a regulatory tool. Um, it's really just a planning tool, but we're hoping that um, it will provide the sort of guidance that will help you get through permitting um, easier because you'll be avoiding the, the um, habitats that are of most concern. The yellow areas are more in between. They, these are areas that may require additional information um, from either resource agencies or other entities, um, or there may be mitigation that's necessary. And there is overlap. So a lot of these resources are buffered resources. So you may end up with a buffered stream overlapping with a buffered gravel pit. So red overlapping with green. So you really need to dive deep into what each of the layers are that are being presented. Don't simply use um, the visual, make sure that you dive into the data. And we can go right to the tool from the story map, which is what I'm gonna do. And like most online mapping tools, you end up with a disclaimer at the beginning. Please read it the first time you go in. Um, it's basically saying it's not a regulatory tool, it's a planning tool, and that we're using data that are being updated all the time. And just because you may look on the map and not see any resources there, it doesn't mean there aren't resources, they just aren't in the map. So always make sure that you are talking to your natural resource agencies um, and others who may have helpful information. So you click OK and say, okay, here. The map that we come up with is the map of the state with all these orange lines and dots on it. This is the electrical infrastructure of Maine. The orange lines are the transmission lines and the dots are the substations. This is because any renewable energy project coming into Maine or being developed or coming online has to tie into the grid. And so for planning renewable energy projects, you have to start with where the electrical infrastructure already exists, particularly for solar, because they really have to be close to the grid. Um, it's just much too expensive to, to build your own transmission line or distribution line. Um, and they have to be close, so they have to be close to the existing infrastructure. On the left-hand side is a panel with some buttons at the top, and I'll walk you through these. The first one is an overview, which explains what the tool is, some of the same information that's in the story map, and explains the, <clears throat> the stoplight model that we use. The next button, if you hover over any of these, it tells you what the button is for. This tells you about the data layers. It's just an overview. We have 35 different data layers in here, and um, because that's so many, we have lumped them together into different groupings, depending on what type of data they are. So we have energy resources, we have environmental resources, previously developed areas, agricultural layers, and then administrative boundaries like parcels and towns, as well as roads. The next button that's a little folded map is your base map options. We come in with the modern antique. This is one of the simplest maps. Um, so if it starts getting, if you're playing around in the tool and it starts getting sluggish and you have one of the other maps on, it might be good to switch over to modern antique. I like to jump over to imagery so you can see the background, that there are a lot of different backgrounds that you can, um, you can play with. The next button is the legend, and this will show you what layers are turned on and visible. When you come into the tool, most layers are actually turned off. There are a few layers that are turned on, but you won't be able to see them until you zoom in. Because if you had all the layers on at this scale, it would be, it would be too chaotic. You wouldn't be able to actually learn anything from it. So they are turned off until you zoom in closer. The legend shows you what is on and visible. And this last button with the lines, it's a little list with a drop down is 
where you get to those buckets of data with those groupings of data. So the first one is energy resources. So you can see we have the substations and the transmission lines turned on. If you click the tiny little arrow in the front, it shows you what that um, what the icon is for that particular data set. And then you can close it back up again. The next group is the environmental layers. You notice that most of these are grayed out. That's because they won't turn on until you zoom in close because this is a very, very busy group of data sets. And you can see that this one is actually clicked, checked on, but it's grayed out so you don't see anything. If we zoom in, the red blobs that are the beginning with habitat focus areas here show up. If we zoom back out, they disappear. So that shows you that some of them turn on um, as we get closer and further away. The next list is previously developed layers. These are gravel pits, landfills, super fun sites. You'll notice there are two listings for gravel pits and landfills. That's because at a, a um, scale that's further out, they're presented as points. But as you zoom in, the little purple ones are a person digging, that's a gravel pit, and the um, little brown ones are a little pile of, of dirt, it's a landfill. So as we zoom in, those icons go away and they're replaced with polygons. And you can see that over here, the boundaries are now no longer grayed out, but the gravel pits are. So that's just a little trick to understand, particularly for those two layers. Agricultural layers include prime farmland soils, soils of statewide importance and large agricultural blocks. And these are um, identified as parcels of five acres or more contiguous acres of cropland or 10 acres or more contiguous of pasture land. Finally, the administration boundaries include parcels, public roads, counties, towns um, to help you navigate and roadways as well. Um, and then the last option here is to add data. You can actually pull your own data in. No one else will see it. It will only be on your, um, that's on your version. You can pull from ArcGIS online. You can pull from a URL, from, from a web service, or if you have a, a shape file, CSV file, an XML file, or a K, KML file, you can pull those in directly. So if you have an area you're interested in or additional resources you want to look at, if you have local zoning that you want to pull in, you can do that right in the tool itself. So now I want to walk you through a little bit of um, how to use the map itself. There is a way to zoom into a town. I'm going to just jump to Sebago. It's a drop-down list. It, it's, you can't put in a particular address, but you can go to the town. It will highlight the town. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna turn off some of the agricultural layers. So we can see here's the boundary of the town and, and all that's visible right now are the focus areas from the beginning of habitat and the gravel pit boundaries and landfill boundaries. That's all, well, ground fields are there as well. So if we zoomed into some of these areas, now I'm not saying that this is where something should or shouldn't go. I just, I'm just walking you through the tool, but we're gonna check out these, these green blobs. So the first thing we wanna do is understand what this represents. So if we just click on that polygon, it will tell you what it is. This is a gravel pit a description of what that means, and then comments like gravel pits can be a great place to, to put solar panels. If you, and also the source of the data, if you notice at the top of the box, it says it's one of two. So we have more than one layer that this is identifying. And you can look at the next layer with this little arrow and it tells you that it's the town and it highlights what that feature is that you're now looking at. And the same is true for this little round one, but this is a landfill and also the town. Now, remember, most of our layers are not turned on yet, but we can take a look and see what it looks like. Oh, you can see the gravel pit. You can see the landfill. I'm gonna go back to the, the base map. And maybe I want, I'm thinking that maybe this is a good place to go 
or maybe it isn't, I want to understand by turning on some of the other layers. You have the option in each of these buckets of these data sets to go to this list and turn on all the layers with one click. You have to give it a minute. Now, this is sometimes when it crashes on me because too many things are happening, but I'm going to be very patient. You can see that we ha now have some of that overlap that I was talking about. Here's a green circle for a landfill, but underneath it is a red polygon and there's some yellow and there's additional red. Same is true over here. So we wanna understand what these are. So we would, um, you can either turn things on or off. So you can see that one goes away that was conserved land, or you can again, click that identity tool. And hopefully it won't crash on me. And you get the pop-up that explains that polygon is conserved land. We have forest blocks in the background, but if we understand where our landfill itself is, we can see that's a little bit outside of the, the disturbed area for the landfill. Oh, and that's what I was afraid of. Not to worry. I will try one more and then I can go to slides. Um, but the idea is you want to go in and make sure you examine what all those layers are, because where those the boundary is for the conserved land, that's really just a municipal property. So maybe it's still appropriate um, because there's a landfill within something that's red. Maybe it, it doesn't mean it's inappropriate to be looking at that area. So... We're back to our same area and maybe what I will do is turn on a couple of layers. We knew we had conserved land and forest blocks. So now there are a couple of tools here that we can, we can use. I'm gonna put on my imagery and maybe we know that we need a certain amount of energy which, which requires a certain amount of, of area we can measure that area. We can measure distance. We can also measure an area and you can choose your, um, the units and I'm gonna use acres and then we simply draw around the area of interest and it will calculate um, the acres or if you want say, oh, I meant to say in square feet, it'll simply calculate the square feet. A couple of the other tools are really about um, gathering additional information on a particular site. I'll just do quick um, examples of these. The first is a quick assessment where you can identify your area of interest and it will give you information on a set of data layers that are pre-identified um, and they will see what intersects with that. They don't have to be turned on and they don't have to be visible for this tool. For the other tool, you will only get a response back for the things that are turned on and visible. You will get an exclamation mark saying um, that it's not visible for the other ones. So I'm hoping that this will not crash again. And let's say we're interested in this whole area. And now you can see we have all of these different um, data sets down here. We don't have any substations in our polygon or wind projects, but we do have landfills. And you get some basic information on the landfill and it shows you where that is. We also have some conserved land. Again, I don't have this on right now, but it still shows me what that polygon is. It will tell you the acreage of the actual polygon, not only the part that's intersected. So that's a really important thing to remember. It's the entire, um, the entire polygon. Same thing with forest blocks. This is a very large forest block. We're only catching a corner of it, but it's still telling you that the forest block itself is over 2000 acres. And there are additional layers to look at. Um, again, just what's being intersected. And rather than tempt fate, I will see what I can do with um, the other tool. The screening tool, again, is really focused on the things that you have turned on and that are visible, and you can actually um, create a report from it. 
So you have different ways to identify the area of interest. You can draw an area or you can pull in your own shape file. If you have something like that, I'm gonna just draw. I'll do that same, it's not a good sign. There we go. Shows us our area of interest. And then when we click report, it starts running through all of the layers that are in here. The zeros mean I've got electric substations turned on, but there aren't any in my area of interest, but I don't have wind turbines turned on. And so I get an exclamation point. It still lists them, but we have an exclamation point. I can now go down to the conserved lands, click on that plus, and it will give me the information um, that it's pulling from that conserved land. I can also go up and hit the print button. And this will generate, this sometimes takes a couple of minutes. This will generate an actual report, giving you a summary of all of the things that um, were turned on and visible and what the results were, if there were acres associated with it. Um, it's, it's running through right now, trying to build a map. It will actually give you a map of your area of interest, but it also then goes through each of these features or variables that we were interested in and give you the additional information. This may take a minute, so rather than, than spending your time on that, um, you can go in and, and play around in it. I will move out of this. Um, so you can have that report, you can generate a PDF or you can print it out. You can include it in any other materials that you're developing. And I'm going to now move out of this and go back to my PowerPoint. So I walked you through all of these tools. And this is what the report would look like. You would have an actual map with the area of interest. Remember this one only identifies or analyzes the layers that are turned on and visible. And a quick wrap up on the tool that's a whirlwind tour of it. Um, things to keep in mind. I hope you're seeing. Yeah, Sarah, are you we're not seeing? seeing no, we're yeah. not seeing it. I told you I would screw that up. Are you seeing it now? Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Um, as we were starting, I said, I'm probably going to screw this up. So this is what it would look like then. Um, it's just a map with the area of interest, print out with all of those features identified and any of the attributes. And that's a quick overview of the tool. Things to remember about the tool. It's for planning purposes only. It's not a regulatory map. It doesn't include all the resources that may be important. We have talked to the natural resource agencies. They've seen the tool. They understand that it's out here, um, but please listen to them first. They have more up-to-date information and they can give you the guidance that you may need. The data are from a variety of sources. They're being updated all the time, but at different time periods. So for example, the beginning with habitat focus areas are being worked on right now. They will be updated probably the end of this year or early next year. We will update the, the data in here when that happens. And we try to use data sets that are most applicable to the real world and that are consistent with other tools. So beginning with Habitat's a great example, we use a lot of data from that in partnership with IFNW so that we're all seeing the same boundaries, we're all having the same understanding and, and having the same conservation aims across all of these different data sets. Finally, the reminder that not everything will um, draw until you're zoomed in, in and you have to turn, turn on the data sets that you're interested in. If you turn them all on, um, the site will crash like we just saw. And finally, we are working on a couple of additional tools. We are gonna have a jam-packed toolbox when we're done, toolkit when we're done. Um, Neil mentioned questions about um, visibility and plantings, and we are working on a guide to planting native pollinator-friendly seed mixes. Um, but also some guidance on some recommendations for shrubs and things like that that can help be visual barriers to, um, to help folks um, accept some of these renewable energy projects. As more wildlife-friendly solar projects get on the landscape, we're going to be working to highlight them 
on our website because we want to show this can be done and, and how it can be done. And finally, we're working on a guide to community solar as well. And I think questions are happening at the end. And I will stop sharing so we can move on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was excellent. Uh, yes, please, if you have questions, I see one now down in the chat. Um, and uh, we are want to make sure we end uh, on time. So I want to turn it right over to Ben Axelman from Nexan. Ben, take it away. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, let me just share my screen. Oh, uh, can everyone see that? Not yet. Not yet. Got it. Uh, let's see. There it is. There it is. Perfect. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Ben Axelman. Um, I'm a developer with Nexamp. We are a solar energy company that is uh, based out of Boston. Um, and has been in business uh, for about uh, 12 years now. Uh, we are a, uh, just to give a very quick background on who we are, what we do, um, we are a, a veteran founded uh, solar energy company. Uh, we are a, a full cycle uh, solar company. So we do our own project development, construction, uh, financing, um, and then um, owning and operating of solar projects. Um, we are a, a national uh, developer at this point. We we're based in Massachusetts, but we're now active all over the country. Um, and um, we are um, backed by uh, Diamond Generating Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Mitsubishi. Um, and we've been heavily active in the main solar market, uh, both developing and constructing um, kind of commercial scale uh, community solar projects in the state. Um, so uh, my goal with this presentation is basically just to, um, you know, tell let this audience know basically who are the companies that are uh, developing projects in Maine, what is it that we're looking for with these projects, um, what is it that, you know, if a project, if a company uh, proposes a solar project in your town, you know, why might they have picked that spot, and kind of how does the whole business side of it work, because that may not be immediately apparent to, uh, to people on the municipal level. So there are a number of uh, business models that solar companies, um, you know, uh, have adopted um, in the state and elsewhere. Um, both uh, residential, one is the, is the scale of the project that you're working on. Residential typically means putting solar panels on your roof um, and selling power directly to the household or just installing panels and having the, the homeowner own them. Uh, commercial scale is, is roughly what uh, Nexamp does, which are uh, grid tied, you know, couple megawatt size projects that are often uh, power sold to uh, municip municipalities or community solar projects. And then utility scale is typically uh, larger projects, um, maybe, you know, 10 to 20 megawatts where it's tying into high voltage transmission lines um, and often looking to sell power out of state. Um, there are also multiple business models around uh, you know, being a, a pure developer or an owner. Um, a pure developer is a company that will look to develop a project and then sell it to someone else who will own and operate. Um, and then uh, the ownership model is, you know, we basically make money by uh, building and then uh, selling power from the projects. Uh, you know, both are, are totally viable models, but, you, you know, you might... Um, it, it, an ownership model may, uh, you know, uh, there, there are pluses and minuses to both. Um, and uh, it's helpful to know kind of how the developer that's op operating your community um, is looking to, to make money from it. Um, and then in terms of revenue streams from these solar projects, uh, development fees are basically what you would make by uh, developing and flipping a solar project. Um, electricity and renewable energy credit sales are how uh, the people that own and operate solar projects uh, will make money. Um, and then um, all solar projects are eligible for some federal tax credits, uh, which you have to monetize in order to uh, have a viable solar project. Um, so when you know, when we're out looking for a new solar project, what is it that we're looking for? You know, first, obviously, we're looking for a site that has good solar access. So, you know, are there, um, you know, are, are you have good southern exposure? Are there any um, obstacles in the way that 
um, are going to block the access of sunlight to the property. Now, if there are trees on the site, can they be removed to allow for solar access or are there environmental restrictions, you know, wetlands or species or anything like that that will prevent that? And if so, you have to design the project around, um, you know, around uh, avoiding um, shading impacts because obviously having shade on your panels will, uh, you know, make it a non-viable project a lot of the time. Um, environmental restrictions are also critical, you know, um, similar to the siting map that we just saw, we want to avoid uh, environmentally sensitive uh, areas that will have, uh, you know, permitting um, requirements or restrictions that may make the project impossible or more expensive to build. Um, tying into the grid is, all, is also uh, very critical. Um, you know, like Sarah said, the uh, these solar projects, at least especially on the uh, commercial scale, um, we're looking to tie into existing grid infrastructure. We're not, you know, a, a, a utility scale, you know, 10, 20, 30 megawatt solar project might be able to afford, you know, upgrading a substation or building a new transmission line. But most of the projects that are being developed in the state now are uh, requiring access to the existing grid infrastructure to be viable. Um, so you know, finding a site where you know you don't have to have massive transmission upgrades to tie in is is critical. Uh, constructability also very important. You know we can build. We typically look for pretty flat sites. Uh, the higher you know, if we're you're looking at very rocky terrain, building on the side of a hill, uh, ledge that can drive up the cost of construction uh, significantly and make it so that the project is no longer viable. Um, and then lastly, uh, which is more of a, a qualitative thing, is compatibility with existing land use. You know, we're looking for sites that um, are, you know, uh, either, I mean, obviously the, the best case here is, is working on uh, a capped landfill or, you know, an old gravel pit or something like that. But uh, absent that, are you in line with the, uh, you know, the land use of the community or, you know, you, you don't want to build a site that is uh, immediately next to, say, a subdivision, and having a lot of a lot of residential neighbors. You don't want to do it in a place that's going to be very visible next to some scenic resources. Uh, so those are you know things to to consider when you're picking a site, and also when you're looking to uh, regulate solar, as you know a lot of the communities here are. Uh, so what goes into one of these solar projects? Uh, site control is uh, basically the first thing that we have to do is get the permission from whoever owns the property to build a solar project there. That's often the that's often in the form of a lease agreement. Uh, sometimes it's a land purchase where we'll purchase the property once the project um, is is approved. Um, uh, but yeah, we need to basically have permission from whoever owns the property to to build it, and that's the case for uh, you know rooftop projects as well. Um, we need to obtain uh, permits from uh, from the town um, and often from the state as well. Um, you know, uh, the if you're over uh, 20 acres of land disturbance, you know that triggers a SLOTA permit. If you have uh, any wetlands on site, uh, that can um, trigger state level wetland permitting. Um, there are also some uh, you know federal permits that can be triggered often through the Army Corps. Um, the interconnection process is also, um, you know, something that we have to go. We have to get permission from uh, CMP or Versant to tie into the grid, um, and then find. We have to find um, a people who are going to uh, pay us money for the electricity or net energy billing credits generated by the project, um, and then we need to, um, you know, often uh, enter into a tax agreement or uh, figure out how the project is going to be taxed. Um, which I'll speak to in a, in a second. On the site control side, um, we are looking for either a purchase option or a lease. Typically, um, we require that the uh, land have a, a cheap, clean chain of title so that we can guarantee that uh, the um, you know the uh, that that when we build this project, we actually are signing a lease with the person who actually owns it, and there aren't uh, other entities that. Uh, may have some rights on the property. If there are, we have to work through those and make sure that uh, everything is uh, is clear so that we can we can fund it. Um, and then basically how these how these leases work, um, we have uh, you know typically a couple years to go out and try to develop the project. 
Um, if we're successful, that triggers a you know, construction period, and then the project will um, operate for typically 20 to 40 years. Um, and then we'll have requirements in there for, uh, for decommissioning the project as well. Um, on, the, oops, on the permitting side, uh, we are subject to uh, whatever ordinances the town puts in place. Um, you know, Maine is a home rule state, so uh, towns can kind of regulate solar um, in any way that they see fit. So we have to get smart about what that process is and then um, adhere to it. Um, often this involves getting a special permit or site plan review uh, through the planning board, and in some cases the CBA, but usually it's a planning board. Um, and then uh, we trigger, there are some triggers that we might hit for, um, uh, for some state level or federal uh, permitting. And then if you're building a rooftop project, often that only requires pulling a building and electrical permit. Um, on the interconnection side, uh, basically roughly how this process works, we submit a, an application to the utility saying, hey, we wanna tie two megawatts of power into this line at this location. Uh, the utility will complete a study to determine uh, whether there are any impacts to the system of putting that much power on the grid, uh, which can be impacted by, you know, how much load is already on the line. Are there existing generators, you know, solar or wind uh, already on this circuit? Um, and, um, and then they will come back with a list of required upgrades that you have to do in order to tie the project into the grid. Um, and so the, 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 way that the, the way that this works is that they can't tell you that you can't interconnect, but they can come back with a cost to interconnect that makes the project cost prohibitive. So uh, you know, they might say, oh, in order to tie in a solar project to this location, because there are so many other solar projects proposed in this area, you would need to replace a transformer at this substation you know, for $5 million. And in that case, you know, the solar project is probably not going to be viable. So um, you know, that's kind of the, the balancing act that we're working with here. And then ultimately that leads to an interconnection agreement where um, we agree to pay the cost of those upgrades, the utility completes the upgrades, and then once those are completed, they let you turn the project on. Um, power sales are uh, obviously also a critical aspect of this. Uh, we, you know, the way that we make money is by generating electricity and uh, having them typically uh, by participating in the net energy billing program generating NEB credits that we will then sell to uh, either uh, you know, commercial uh, off takers that have uh, good credit ratings that we can finance off of, or uh, community solar customers where we will uh, you know, sell power to individual households um, at, a, at, a, um, at a discount. Um, and they will agree to, to pay us for the cost of those credits every month. Um, you know, uh, Different companies structure this differently, but um, community solar has been a, a big uh, part of uh, um, of solar in Maine, and I'm sure that some of you have seen uh, different advertisements or flyers for that. So I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have about uh, community solar programs. But um, that's a you know a lot of the solar projects in Maine are being financed that way, um, and yeah, that's the, that's just a, a high level. Um, that is a high level overview of, of who the companies are that were that are active in Maine and, and what kind of considerations we're looking for, but happy to answer uh, specific questions during the Q&A. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Ben. And let's bring everybody back if we can. And uh, I'm gonna <coughs> try to avoid coughing with my sore throat and I'd love to take some questions. So if you all have questions, um, and want to put them in the Q&A box down below, that would be great. Um, I know, um, Sarah, do you want to go over any of the questions that you've answered already? She's been um, tackling some of them with her text, but maybe there are some that she wants to um, share with a larger group. Sure, well, I'll run through them because um, some folks may have the same questions. Um, the first question is a great one. Who is expected to be using this? Do you have to be a GIS professional or is this really um, for town managers? We are hoping that this is a tool that's usable for anyone. We're hoping that it was built in, in such a way that it's easy enough to use, especially 
um, with the story map that we've built that can walk you through some of those slightly more complicated pieces like those, those reporting tools at the end. You should not have to be a GIS professional. Um, and it is brand new, so we would love to hear feedback, uh, both on ease of use, problems you're having, um, additional layers you might want to see, and, and things like that. We're hoping that developers use it, town managers, um, and just interested landowners, anyone who's interested. Um, and then the follow-up question is, how patient do you need to be to get that report to, to come up? That um, really depends on your two things, your connection and what time of day it is, oddly enough. Um, this tool uses a lot of public data sets, and it sort of in GIS circles understood that anything that is accessing those base maps or any other public data sets are best accessed before everyone in the country is online trying to access them. So you do it sort of before 9 or after 8 p.m. Um, at least before noon. Um, the worst time is going to be in the afternoon, right around 12 to 1 is going to be when most people are online. Um, so timing can be can make a difference as well. Um, and then there was a question on whether the tool identifies a protected areas by name and owner. We have scrubbed most of the attributes from the data sets, but they are, um, except for some of the um, beginning with habitat data sets, some of those um, natural resource data sets, most of the other data sets are public. And so they're publicly available. You can find that information on the original data sets, but we've removed a lot of the attributes just to make it simpler as opposed to um, trying to cover, uh, trying to, um, to make it difficult to find that information. Um, and the last one I will jump on is the status of so citing solar rays on parking lots. This is a great idea and we hear this a lot. Why aren't we just doing parking lots and buildings? And I will let Ben jump in on that one too, but um, there's been a lot of research looking into that and the costs are really, really fairly prohibitive. Um, in terms of maintaining renewable energy at affordable prices. Um, some corporations and individual industries are doing that on their own properties, and that's a fantastic place to start. And maybe as um, we get more efficiencies, um, we'll see it elsewhere. I don't know if Ben has other, other thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think cost is the, is the biggest uh, issue there. Um, it's um, you can get close to uh, normal ground mounted cost, not you can't quite get there, but you can get in the same ballpark if you're building at scale, uh, but you need a, a pretty large parking lot in order to get there uh, for uh, one off, you know, filling a smaller parking lot with solar panels, it's pretty expensive. Uh, we've done a number of carport projects uh, in Massachusetts and some other places, but in that in those cases, uh, you know, the state is uh is subsidizing it specific the, the incentive program has a specific carve out for uh canopy structures um and nothing like that exists in maine at the moment so I, I think that it's a great idea and i think it will probably i think you'll see carports get built in maine um eventually uh but not quite yet uh, unless if they don't if there's no um incentive program uh then it will probably just take a little bit longer for the cost to come down some more um, uh, also, as uh, solar gets built out in, in rural areas and the cost of time to the grid there goes up, you know, parking lot areas are usually in areas where it, it, there isn't a lot of other open land to do solar. So you may see the cost of time to the grid be relatively cheap there and some parking structures get built. But um, it's a great idea and it's a, it, they're, they're certainly viable, but it, the cost is the largest driver. And I, there's a related question for you in the in the uh, Q&A here about um, the reaction you've had from trying to build solar near neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from one one way to look at it is that, you know, places that are close to disturbed land or already disturbed are great places. Um, what's the reaction from um, from from neighborhoods uh, when you when you try to build nearby? Um, it depends. Um, I think that um, a lot of it depends on what the land was used for before, you know, if it was a, a pristine, you know, natural habitat, uh, people may, you know, object to uh, to cutting that down and, and building a solar farm. If you're talking about an old gravel pit or a landfill near residences, uh, people will probably be more open to that. Um, I mean, I think typically the only the the concern that people have about solar um, is is uh, is mostly related to view shed. It's, you know, have, am I going to see the solar panel? How far away is it from my house? 
How far away is it from the road? Are there going to be, you know, screening in place? Um, you know, like wind energy has, you know, a number of, of negative externalities that makes, it makes noise, it casts shadow, uh, things like that. Solar doesn't really have any of that. So uh, just the view is typically the largest concern. And so, you know, I think solar panels are, are beautiful and I would be happy to, to live next to a solar field, but not everyone feels that way. So finding a way to place it in a place where it's, it's less of a visual impact is usually what people are looking for. And so, yeah, if, if, it's in a, if it's near a neighborhood, but it's on an old landfill and you've got some screening, then sure, if it's I'm, I'm clear, clear cutting 20 acres and putting panels right next to your house, then yeah. people will be upset about that. There's one thing I've learned from buying a house in the last couple of years is that neighbors aren't happy with anything you do. Yeah. So, guy, <laughs> guy told me my shutters didn't look good. All right. um, another question in the chat about um, question one on the upcoming election in Maine. Um, part of question one would require two thirds approval of the legislature for transmission lines across um, transmission lines for solar projects that cross state owned lands. Um, Sarah, do you have any insight into that? Um, I think that we do need to think really hard about uh, transmission lines. So right now, and Nick, maybe you can um, make sure that I'm on track here. Um, the activities that happen on state lands if they're going to have a big impact, have to go in front of the legislature for that two thirds approval. Um, there's a question about whether um, something like a transmission line would have to, the courts seem to, to feel that, that that is the case. Um, there's another piece of question one about um, the legislature being required for two thirds um, approval for any significant transmission lines that's over 50 miles um, and 375 kV. Um, and we really need to think hard about that um, because we do need transmission. Um, that is, the electrical infrastructure in Maine is pretty old and pretty um, pretty much full already. And so um, there are estimates that we may need between three and five times the transmission capacity that we have right now, if we're gonna meet that 100% renewable energy goal by 2050. So we do wanna make sure that we are able to um, get enough transmission on the landscape and, and do it in a, in a reasonable, responsible way. Um, I think that would be my thought. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have much to add. I see we're at the one uh, hour mark, um, but I will put in the chat, Maine Audubon, we just released um, some information about question one, just um, a lot of um, sort of feeling out the questions and, uh, and allowing people to get some more info. So um, take a look there if you'd like to uh, see our position more in depth. Um, anything to add, Ben, on that? No, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, translate, this is kind of out, out of my wheelhouse, um, but I think, yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, new transmission needs, should be like, we'll probably need some, but needs to be done in a way that uh, minimizes impact to, uh, um, you know, to the natural environment and natural resources. And also, uh, you know, is, is really necessary and will help with the climate. So I'll leave it right there. On. Well, I see that we are coming in right on time. There are no more questions in the chat. I wanted to follow up very quickly with something that Neil mentioned at the top about decommissioning plans. Um, Maine Audubon supported uh, a great law that was passed this past legislative session that uh, requires decommissioning plans for projects over three acres. Um, that law took effect yesterday um, and uh, it applies to projects that were initiated um, after October 1st of this year. So. Yes, decommissioning plans are a part of the future for um, solar projects in Maine. So that's all we have. Um, I wanna thank Sarah Haggerty. I wanna thank Ben Axelman. I wanna thank Neil Goldberg and Maine Municipal Association for having us on today. And I want to uh, wish everyone a great rest of your week. All right. Thank you. Thanks thank everyone. You. Take care everyone. See you Take later. Care.